Good morning. Uh, I'm José Pio Borges, chairman of the board of the trustees of uh, SEBRE, the Centro Brasileiro de Relações Internacionais. And it is with the great pleasure that we have one more event of the uh, culture and international relations program had by uh, my friend Marcos Azambuja, Ambassador Marcos Azambuja, Emeritus Trustee of SEBRE, and Van, uh, Evangelina Seiler, Senior Fellow of SEBRE. We have here today uh, Andrew Newton, the new head of the British Council in Brazil, and, uh, and he's going to talk about the cultural diplomacy and soft power, which is exactly what we meant, SEBRE meant, when created the Cultural International Relations Program. Uh, I really wanted to participate. This is the first event that SEBRI and the British Council uh, uh, will have to uh, have together. And we hope uh, the first of many that we could do uh, in, with this program. And uh, I have uh, the pleasure of have had a very long, uh, years ago, a long relationship with the British Council as chairman of the Passo Imperial Contemporary Museum in Rio. And we did wonderful uh, initiatives, including a huge exhibit of uh, the sculptor uh, Henry Moore. So I pass the word to Van Van to do the proper uh, presentations. And then we'll have our keynote speaker, Andrew Newton, which uh, uh, is going to, I mean, do his. Uh, uh, talk about the, the initiatives of uh, the, the, the the role of the British Council and the initiatives in this uh, team of cultural diplomacy. Van Van, please. Thank you, Piu, for in the, your introductory remarks. My name is Evangelina Seiler, Senior Fellow of the Culture and International Relations Program at SEB. It is great pleasure I will moderate today's event cultural diplomacy and soft power, a partnership between SEBRI and the British Council. Usually, when we think about traditional diplomacy, we imagine a political activity that had the main objective of avoiding war. It was a solid concept for many centuries. However, diplomacy has proved to be much more than that. Diplomacy is not only about reacting to war, but mainly about creating the condition to make war unnecessary. In that sense, cultural diplomacy emerged as a strategy to reinforce international ties and build mutual confidence. Many institutions were created to support and assist their countries in pro promoting culture as a core value of the international society. Some examples are the Good Institute and the Alliance Française. Today, we will have the pleasure to learn from the experience of the oldest cultural relation organization in the world, the British Council. The organization work is in, is in more than 100 countries in the Americas, there are overseas office from Canada to Argentina. To start our debate, I will introduce our participants. Andrew Newton, our keynote speaker. Thank you, Andrew, for being with us. Director of the British Council in Brazil. Andrew graduated in modern languages from Goldsmith University of London and holds an MBA from the Open University School. No. Open University Business School, I'm sorry. With a strong participation in the digital area at the British Council, he has led projects at the Art, Education, and English in Saudi Arabia, in the Middle East, North Africa, mm -hmm. and Pacific Asia, always in partnership with media and technology companies, in addition to having been vice director in Bangladesh. Ambassador Marcos Azambuja, Trustee Emeritus at the Brazilian Center for International Relations, FEBRI. He served as ambassador of Brazil to France and Argentina, as well as head of Brazil's delegation of disarmament and human rights 
Affairs in Geneva. Ambassador Zambuja is currently a member of the Brazilian Historical and Geographic Institute, the Institute of National and Artistic Heritage, and the Roberto Marinho Foundation. I will open our table to the public um, right after um, Ambassador Zambuja talks. So please send your questions to our speakers. It's very important that you do so. Thank you very much. So Andrew is with you now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Evangelina. Thank you, Jose, for the kind introduction and also Ambassador Marcos for the kind invitation from Sevli to be able to join you today uh, to uh, present um, of course, uh, I want to say a few words in Portuguese just to say, sejam bem-vindos, sejam bem-vindos. And thank you also uh, to our Portuguese and um, Brazilian audience, but also internationally as well uh, for joining. So good afternoon if you are in the UK. Uh, I'm really going to talk about 25 minutes, then hopefully we'll have some good discussions. So as Evangelina said, please do send in the questions the ambassador and then be able to pose those questions so we have a very good interactive discussion. And today really a lot of what I'm going to pose I'd like you to think about through the next 25 minutes or so is really what is cultural diplomacy and how in the modern world do we embrace new behaviours coming out of the pandemic, so particularly, for example, embracing technology, as we are doing right now in this session, but also thinking about the ideas and phrases that have been used across the political landscape, such as build back better. What does that actually mean? And what does that encompass, not just for the United Kingdom, Brazil, but also other nations in terms of its soft power strategy and approach in order to build trust. And as Evangelina touched upon, around increasing peace around the world. So I'm going to actually share a few slides. So if you're a multitasker, I would encourage you to keep your eyes focused on the screen because there's some really interesting data and visuals that I'm going to share with you. And uh, that will really hopefully provide the platform for discussion. So as they say in Portuguese, vamos lá. And um, let's, uh, let's uh, share uh, my screen with you. Okay, and then let me just bring up the presentation. So just give one, one second. Okay, so my presentation is really divided into four sections, um, talking about the definition of soft power, the idea of cultural engagement within soft power, some perceptions of soft power from Brazilians about the UK and the UK and Brazil, and also Brazilians on the world. And lastly, about the future and what is soft power in the future. And on the right side, I put some themes that I would encourage you to consider throughout this uh, presentation from peace to the Indo-Pacific tilt. Uh, I talked a little bit with the ambassador yesterday around the overemphasis on the Asia Pacific. Is that the right thing uh, to do? Are we kind of a forgotten part of the world as a result? Thinking about digital influencing. So a lot of conversation has come from meta power rather than uh, soft power. And really that definition is embracing the idea of new technology. So real credit to um, Mark Zuckerberg actually, because um, he, uh, he is actually, I'm um, oh, sorry, I just wanted to check um, that my slides are appearing okay. Can you see my slides? No, okay, I just had a message actually to say that. So let me, um, let me see that if this is working again, if you just give me one second. Okay, okay. 
So hopefully um, you'll be able to see my slides this time around. Can you see my slides now? Okay, yes. thank you. Okay, sorry about that. So um, slight uh, glitch here, but um, always the biggest presentations always have some kind of IT issue to resolve. So um, thank you for my esteemed colleague for sending me a message on WhatsApp to let me know. So really just to say um, what I was covering there is on the left side, the chapters on the right side um, is around uh, the themes that I would like you to consider uh, thinking around digital influencing and looking at the idea of what that means in the new metaverse, which Mr. Zuckerberg has taken ownership of actually as a new brand and thinking about post pandemic and what that means as well as global challenges such as climate and the impact of climate as well. So first off, the definition of soft power. This is the most widely uh, understood definition from Professor Joseph Nye, uh, who actually wrote a book about it. And thinking about the key word in that definition around attraction and attractiveness, okay? The ability to attract others in order to get what you want. But the British Council really focuses on an area of soft power, and we like to call it cultural relations. And there's really a very broad definition, so I just wanted to share with you a couple of things. It's around strengthening of connections and building trust. It's also around mutuality, the idea of mutually beneficial engagement. So if I present that in another way, you can see on this table here that you have soft power and hard power at the top, but underneath that, a range of activities. And really, uh, this diagram is not exact, but it allows us to see where cultural relations fits within the idea of soft power, focusing around education, exchange of culture, convening and networking, and also partnership. And interestingly, uh, researchers said to me last week, and I kind of agree with this, that the idea of soft power is actually focused also very much linked to trade objectives, whereas cultural relations is more around longer term outcome and relationship building. So the UK, so I'm going to be talking obviously as the British Council really through a UK lens, so forgive me a little bit for that, but um, the UK has been doing this for a long time and you can see therefore that um, we feature whether it be in this global soft power index from the brand directory or others, usually in the top five nations. Um, and you can also see that Brazil is in the top 50 there, uh, slightly um, fell a few places, but in an interesting selection of countries there in terms of uh, thinking about what their soft power strategy and engagement is. Interestingly to me when looking at this diagram is actually India falling nine places. I can really think about what that, uh, the reason for that, but something interesting to consider. This report is actually free to download as well on the internet. Still saying the UK has been around really a long time in soft power. And in Brazil, last year we celebrated 75 years as the British Council. And these two images are very stelling to me. One is interesting, there was no coordination but, uh, with Jose, but this is actually at the Sao Paulo Biennale in 1950 with a Henry Moore. And then on the right side, we have the Biennale in 2022. And the British Council has been a long-standing partner of the Biennale throughout this time, building those relationships, building that cultural relations, that attractiveness between the UK and Brazil and the rest of the world. Also in education, we've been doing this for a very long time, really focused around the idea of partnership in higher education, furthering ideas in research. You can see the range of Brazilian partners 
And then on the other side, a real value in soft power, not just for the UK, but for many countries is scholarship. So the UK government has an excellent scholarship program called Shivening, and we, British Council, also focus around STEM and research in STEM, offering right now a scholarship for many young female scientists to go and study in the UK as part of our Women in STEM program. And these scholarship programs really have a great impact at building relationships. I've met many stakeholders in Brazil, either in person or online, and many have shared with me that they actually started their relationship with the UK through a scholarship to go and study in the UK, and it being such an impactful and memorable time as a result. We also focus around the idea of language, because see this session being in English is really highlighting the fact that um, globally communication is really key and communication through English is still, as we say it, a lingua franca. But of course, there are many challenges around English around the world. And I highlight in this report from the Folio de São Paulo, uh, for international uh, viewers, this is uh, a newspaper here in São Paulo, talking about some of the challenges in terms of teacher development and systems in English. So as you can see on the right, we hold a lot of policy dialogues working with teachers across Brazil in order to raise standards in teaching and assessment because this is really the foundation of building the next generation of internationally minded student and person to be able to connect with the rest of the world and not have English as a barrier or an inhibitor to connect and work together. And this is also really embodied to me by the uh, Ciencia Sin Fronteras uh, program, which is Science Without Borders, which Brazil ran a, uh, a number of years ago. And as you can see from this photo, the number of young people who went abroad taking Brazilian culture overseas, taking the Portuguese language, Brazilian Portuguese language overseas, and also representing uh, Brazil and informing and exchanging ideas um, with others around the world, including the UK. You might be able to spot uh, one uh, participant with a hat from Southeast Asia. So really this, um, this program was really broad in terms of its objectives, but it combined two great things, research and science and exchange, also with the idea of language. And um, this is really uh, an important element of building soft power through young people, through young leaders and thinkers in order to build trust over the longer term. But still right now in Brazil, we see that English has been a real challenge despite such great program. This is actually research that we did with Ipsos Mori, and it's a perception survey. And we have one with each G20 nation. So this one is uh, actually with, uh, with um, young Brazilians being surveyed. It's about a thousand sample size, asked about um, you know, the level of English. And you can see that the majority survey said that they only have a little or no English at all. Um, and other research from the British Council in Brazil has told us that actually only 8% of 18 to 24 year olds in Brazil speak English with uh, any level of confidence. If we expand that out to the greater population, it's less than 1%. So really this is an area that we are working towards in cultural relations to be able to help raise standards and opportunity uh, in English language. And as a result of that, I think that um, there's been some challenge in terms of, in the case of Brazil and the UK, that the country's understanding each other very well. Because if you reverse that, of course, I don't think there are many people in the UK who speak Portuguese. And therefore, that creates some kind of a barrier in terms of getting to know each other as countries. 
his perceptions here, as you can see, interestingly, the UK is the red line and um, <laughs> respondents in the UK, thinking about the UK, are quite confident in terms of um, their own perception. Um, Brazilians about Brazil, slightly more mixed, some positive, some negative. But overall, if you just drill down a little more and look at some of the more specific ones around universities and academic research and also uh, cultural institutions, we can see that still in terms of the positive view, I think it hovers around between 40 and 60% which kind of demonstrates to me in my interpretation of this data that uh, we still don't know each other very well. This slide, let me set it up for you a bit. It seems very dense, but actually, um, if you look on the right side, you'll see three areas that I've highlighted. Again, this is a question around to young Brazilians and young British people around uh, their perception of other G20 nations. And you see that Japan actually fares very well uh, in Brazil and also the United States. So despite the fact that the UK has been here for 75 years, we still have a real challenge compared to some of the other G20 nations in terms of increasing perception in certain areas, such as academic research. You can see that Japan has scores very highly at 72% and the USA at 83%. The UK still some work to do a few points um, below. So there is still an opportunity, despite 75 years, of engaging the next generation more positively and making a difference through soft power. So just want to pause here then with that question in mind, is to say, after 75 years of soft power in Brazil, what is the UK really known for? Because if I go to a meeting and talk about culture with uh, a stakeholder, particularly of a certain generation, they will cite often the visits of the royal family to the UK, which of course is very important, but doesn't really sum up uh, the UK as a whole today and an idea of modern Britain. I mean, interestingly for international viewers that, or those who may not be familiar with these photos, on the left side, that's uh, a Royal Majesty uh, coming to open must be in Sao Paulo meeting uh, Tommy Ataki, a very famous Brazilian artist. And then on the right side, that's Prince Charles visiting Rio. And uh, I still get these ideas around um, the UK's brand is built upon the royal family tea and scones. But I'd like to, in the following slide, share with you the fact that we actually, through our soft power work, want to present a more modern UK. And an inspiration as part of that more in more recent years has been uh, Korea. So if you think about Korea as a nation, its nickname was actually the Hermit Kingdom. And I spent some time in Korea working with the Ministry of Education. And at that time, Korea really wasn't a well known in terms of its culture as it is right now. And that's really thanks to a policy by the government to invest in state and non-state working together to provide training opportunities for young people in the creative sector. And you can see on the left side, internationally renowned K-pop, Korean pop sensation, BTS, and there are far many. And that music has really surpassed any other genre of music in terms of its worldwide popularity. And then the right side, uh, this is uh, a show called Squid Game, or in uh, Brazil, it's known as Round Six, which is shown on Netflix and was the most streamed TV show in 2021. And interestingly, uh, the year before, Korea won the Oscar for Best Film. So you can see really that investment in terms of arts, culture, education, and creativity um, really paying dividends for South Korea in terms of its soft power image around the world. And um, the basis for that, as part of the research that I was doing around this, was the fact that the Koreans looked at the idea in the term of the American way of life, the American dream. And they reflected about what was the Korean dream and the Korean dream through lifestyle, culture, food, and how that could permeate throughout the rest of the world. So really an interesting case study. 
Moving forward, of course, um, this is something that they're considering in the future around the metaverse. So if some of you who are not really familiar with what the metaverse is, think about a virtual world, which you can see on the right side, the sole metropolitan government is actually wanting to have its uh, services in the metaverse by next year, and then have the uh, city of Seoul in the metaverse by 2026. So really um, moving that agenda forward, engaging with more people in many other ways. Um, and then I was wondering the UK's response to this and saw today actually that the UK in the UK is investing 23 million pounds into artificial intelligence training for people from non-STEM backgrounds to diversify the uh, skill set of people who will be ready to work in this area. And with that in mind, you know, a common phrase, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, uh, was the idea of build back better. And this is something that has been used in the UK, United States, and other political arenas, particularly with reference um, post-pandemic as we hopefully slowly move out of, uh, of the main waves of the coronavirus. And for the UK, that's really increasing uh, the idea of building connections internationally, exchanging ideas and having fun. In Brazil in 2016, there was the Rio Olympics and around that there was a cultural Olympiad which the UK participated greatly in through British Council programs. You can see this in Rio. And, but however, from there, we've really lost the initiative and the momentum since that time. And it's something that we want to build back better uh, through the programs that we have. Also, there's the opportunity to work together through initiatives in partnership with great institutions in the UK. And the Science Museum is a great partner of ours, but this is not our initiative. This is actually Science Museum partnering with the Brazilian photographer, Sebastian Salgado, who has an exhibition around the Amazon, uh, sort of documenting the Amazon, but also the impact of climate change. Uh, this is running in the UK until March and has actually been sold out for about four months. This week, uh, we're also uh, launching a festival in partnership with uh, Brazilian festival Porto Musical. It's all online. And it's about engaging with young people in modern contemporary arts and culture. And so really we're trying to invest in the future as part of our soft power work and strategy, but also utilizing the learnings from digital during the pandemic to be able to create these platforms, which will be both online and offline with that ability to reach more and more young people to inspire them through great collaboration. And as you can see from this picture, there are actually three Brazilian artists, three uh, UK artists, all women, uh, as part of a program that we call Aza Wings, which focuses around collaborations in music between art female artists from Brazil and the UK. And then taking that a step further, we really also want to embrace the world of offline and online with innovation. And that innovation recently, you may have heard about the term NFTs or non-fungible tokens. So just to clarify, of course, fungibility is about something that can be exchanged equally. Non-fungible is something that cannot be uh, exchanged equally and is unique. And you can see in this picture, there's the famous artist Damien Hirst, who many years ago put uh, a shark in formaldehyde and uh, recently actually launched a new project embracing that idea of online and offline with a choice for people. You could either buy a physical art from him or you could buy an NFT, but you actually had one year to decide which one you wanted. So if you bought the physical piece of art, then it had a code on it and then you got an NFT, then after one year, you could decide which to keep. And if you didn't want the NFT, it would just extinguish there and then, but you still had the physical piece of art. So this is a really great idea uh, of showing the utility and the ways that artists and content creators can really interact with audiences in a very different way. We're also uh, understanding that 
while I was saying language is important, that young people particularly are learning languages and interacting in very different ways. And uh, on the left side, you can see with TikTok that um, this is a new platform for the young generation to be able not just to watch dancing videos, but actually uh, learn language and inter interact with others learning about culture. So the British Council is really focused around its digital offer in terms of language learning and how we can be able to work together with others in partnership to further uh, access to more and more people online with our English language learning content. And that is really also an important tool in terms of just reaching more people across Brazil and around the world. So if I bring us back to uh, this uh, final uh, few slides, you can see here that to me, if we look at this diagram, that really what is important is right at the end in terms of soft power objectives, creating long lasting relationships and engendering trust for generations to come. And that is really the important sub-element of the work that the British Council has been doing for 75 years in Brazil. Of course, meeting foreign policy objectives and trade objectives and working partnership with uh, partners across the UK government, but also building those relationships, ensuring the longevity uh, to continue in Brazil and other countries around the world. So in summary, really, Soft Power 2022 is about responding to some of the ambition of Build Back Better. It's around big events, scale, about memorable interactions and impactful programs, being connected and using digital, inclusive by offering more uh, to more communities and being embracing the idea of open societies having innovative programs and offers. And then lastly, also having some fun, because I think that that is something important for us all right now as well. One area that I didn't really touch upon is perhaps if Sebi invites me back again, we can discuss the idea of decentralization because the idea of power means it's very centralized, but actually the interesting part of digital and the challenge within soft power moving beyond 2022 is actually how soft power is managed in a more decentralized world. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. You can uh, follow me on Instagram or reach at the British Council on Twitter. And um, I think this presentation can be shared as a PDF as well. Thank you so much. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. It was a, a very uh, broad presentation you made of all the, the work British Council is doing, not only here, but all over the world, and all the goals you, you plan to achieve in the future also. That's uh, really, really interesting and a lot to learn. So now I'm going to pass the word to Ambassador Azambuja. Um, thank you. Yes, I, I, uh, first of all, uh, to Andy, uh, con congratulations and thank you. That was a very lucid, very attractive, very fun presentation. Uh, you, you were able to hold our attention, to inform us, and if I may say so, to entertain us also. I noticed that not only India has dropped a few places uh, in the way it's viewed in the world, we also. Uh, Brazil has fallen as I think the same amount of places from 39th to 45th, uh, something which reflects our diminished stature in the world. Basically because we are seen, we have been seen as not competent enough in coping with challenges in the Amazon region. And we have been lenient and tolerant on certain violations of human rights. So Brazil has also been uh, damaged uh, internationally in its soft power in the way we are perceived by the world. I'm delighted to see that most countries have been doing, I think, the right thing. Uh, and they have taken, I'm speaking now about mostly the major Western countries. Uh, the Instituto Cervantes, uh, the, 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 Portuguese Camões Institute, uh, 
the Goethe Institute in Germany yourselves, Jans Francaise, it, there is a general perception that it's worthwhile investing time, money, and talent into suggesting to the world what you are, attracting more attention and more friendship towards yourself. So Brazil is also doing a few things on a much smaller scale. First of all, I would like to celebrate the fact that with the Portuguese speaking countries, we have created something which we call CPLP, the community of Portuguese speaking countries, which is a good project uh, involving Portugal ourselves, the African countries that speak Portuguese, the Asian countries that speak Portuguese. So we are doing something. Besides that, we have in a number of countries invested in a present in certain universities where houses of Brazil or, or Brazilian centers exist, not on the scale, a global scale, but there is something there which is worth pursuing further. So I think this is what I think that right now Brazil is in one of those hopefully very good moments in which we can correct things which we have done, which have damaged us. Damaged us. And in the process of correcting these, uh, gain territory in terms of prestige, acceptability, likeness. Brazil used to be more liked, um, seen as a more friendly country. We must return to being essentially what we are. I won't embarrass you by talking about Brazilian domestic problems right now. But as you know, we are going through a moment in which some Brazilian characteristics have been neglected. Our tendency to be tolerant, our tendency to be inclusive. We have been somewhat uh, incompetent in pursuing policies which have always worked well for us, racial tolerance, respect for human rights, a feeling that this is a country which is in a sense open to the world and in a sense a matrix to what the world is diverse enough to accommodate everyone. So I think that your presentation was very interesting. What I'd like to uh, make one point, which I, I think is relevant. I've moved in my life from a vision, which was the vision of exclusiveness to the one of inclusiveness. This is a very major revolutionary change. When I was a young man, everything was open to become exclusive. A school was good as long as it was exclusive. A club was glued as long as it was exclusive. Everything suggested restriction, selection, that you would uh, erect barriers so that fewer people would come in, but those would be highly qualified. So the idea of exclusiveness was in our minds. Now the word is inclusiveness, an acceptance of open door policies that everyone should be made welcome. Then of course we must have qualifying uh, tests, but basically the approach is to open doors, to open arms, to open opportunities. So I think that we in, in Sebri have modeled ourselves in a number of foreign institutions, uh, which we think are exemplary. I mentioned to you before Chatham House, and I think that there are a few other things which in a sense, suggest to us. We are not an embryonary. I think uh, SEBRI is not a future British Council. We are not that kind of body. We are not that kind of club. We, we seek something different. But there is in ourselves the need to accommodate culture as soft power, culture as the capacity to attract, to seduce, to invite, uh, which is essential. So we must, in a sense, pursue policies which are closely connected to what the British Council and other things, other institutions also perform. So I'd like to thank you for being here. We have now in Rio today, I understand the chairman of the, uh, of the Instituto Cervantes is in Rio today. So this is essential and especially, I don't see any virtue in any pandemic, but some residual value that is in so much suffering is that 
the idea of the world as a community has been made so transparent, so obvious, that I think culture is the tool to make that community uh, better, performing better, in a sense, more generous, with greater solidarity. So uh, I'm not in any say praising anything about the pandemic, but in a sense, residually, it brought to mind this idea that the world is one large community. So I'd like to thank you for being with us, for the information you brought. I was wondering whether, uh, with exception of Japan, I don't see yet uh, other Asian countries in Korea also uh, uh, doing the kind of policies which uh, the major Western countries have pursued. But they will come because they will become aware that this is a valuable tool to influence, to seduce, to convince, to approach, and that the costs are involved. If you compare it to a military expenditure, culture remains the cheapest way to influence people. So uh, one aircraft carrier on the seas for two days uh, is, costs more perhaps than the whole budget of the British Council for a year. So, so much for uh, the investment in peace, in culture, and I think that you're being with us. Sebri, by creating with Evangelina and, and Pio Borges, this forum for cultural and, and diplomacy is suggesting that we are aware that we must also uh, play a bigger role. I was delighted to see uh, your references to Sebastião Salgado, who is a dear friend, and what he is accomplishing. Uh, Sebastião Salgado, he is a secret weapon. He, 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 by showing his sensitivity to human suffering and to environmental damage, helps Brazil more than all publicity we might have. His criticism is better to us than the money we invest in trying to praise ourselves. So much power to enlightened, constructive criticism into a vision that Brazil has a duty towards the world, and we hope to do the right thing. So thank you for your presentation, and I hope that I will learn even more by questions that will uh, be addressed to you, not to me. Uh, my job was to welcome you, to say how valuable it is to have the British Council here, and hope that you may have in Rio also a physical base. You know, I, I'm old enough uh, to use electronic uh, digital means, but I still like physicality. I like buildings. I like uh, environments where people are present physically. So I hope that soon the British Council will have uh, in one of our neighborhoods uh, a physical base uh, so that we can congregate and in a sense celebrate an old friendship. Thank you, uh, Van Van. Back to you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you for enlightening us over all these talks about uh, culture as soft power. Thank you very much. So now we are going to open to the questions from the public. Uh, if we don't make all the questions, please understand we don't have much time to do so. We have uh, 19 questions here or comments, but uh, we are going to start with uh, Lourdes Marinho. Uh, she asks, would you kindly, she asks for Andrew, would you kindly comment on how your, you perceive the opportunities for continuously evolving the Brazilian diplomacy, especially with partnerships in education policies? Yeah, th thank you very much uh, for the question. And uh, I think that this is uh, a really important um, topic, actually, because it comes back to the idea of mutuality. So everything that um, I've talked about in the presentation, pretty much, is around partnership. So it's working to be able to exchange ideas and therefore that in turn engenders trust. So in terms of Brazil, in, in terms of its public diplomacy, 
and in foreign policy, the opportunity there is to be able to collaborate more uh, with other countries, including the UK, and be able to therefore offer programs and ideas and exchange, uh, which really then ensures uh, that positive engagement continuing um, throughout a lifetime. So that really longitudinal uh, approach to be able to build relationships over the period of time is really important and fundamental. And I think that this is uh, also really important during a rather um, interesting year, of course, with the elections coming up in Brazil, the fact that you can still, we can still, the British Council engage with great institutions uh, such as CNIPK to be able to work together in terms of scientific research and provide that opportunity. So I think that that also furthers uh, the ongoing um, diplomacy for Brazil in leading on world leading research and um, scientific partnership with the UK. And I would cite that in, in as a good example is actually the research that has gone on around the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine and Brazil being an important partner in actually realizing that. And that is really a good example of where, you know, uh, cult, uh, diplomacy comes into play um, through science, um, both on Brazilian and UK side. Uh, there is another question uh, from Lourdes Marinho that um, she would like to ask also your view about the opportunity for building partnerships regarding sustainability projects. I have to say, I have, I have been in UK and I understand Brazil could evolve immensely with commercial partnerships about recycling. Yes, so I, I think that that is um, one particular area that is part of, you know, the work that's on something that the global community, as um, the ambassadors refer to, which I really like, is something that we're trying to tackle together. So there is an opportunity, I think, in terms of being able to work together, particularly in the area of recycling. Um, interestingly, I think that uh, we, therefore, that idea of mutuality and also knowledge exchange is, again, essentially important because I think there are great case studies in Brazil whereby UK can actually learn from initiatives around recycling. Um, I've seen a few examples in the state of Sao Paulo, which um, could be taken back to the streets of London, if I'm being completely honest, around recycling. But also the fact that that collaboration is really important. The British Council plays a role, as does U partners across the UK uh, government spectrum uh, here in Brazil, the network, is uh, to be able to act as a intermediary, if you like, a connector to be able to connect opportunities um, uh, for those in that area in Brazil with uh, those in the UK. So, uh, but a very important topic and, and issue. And um, we offer, should I say, to just final um, part of this is, you know, grants that we have uh, every year to have researchers in specific areas to be able to collaborate with partners in the UK. And it's been an ask of the Brazilian, um, consulate uh, in, in, uh, in London, Consulado, to also look at increasing partnerships uh, around research, particularly in these areas. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Uh, we have a question from Ana Paula Oliveira. She would like to know in which ways the UK through the British Council, excuse me, you, uh, I would like to know in which ways the UK through the British Council is cooperating with Fundação Bienal and other Brazilian art institutions to advance the UK-Brazil cultural relations. Yes, so as you can see from my uh, presentation, that we have a long-standing relationship with the BNR, and um, that collaboration has been ongoing for many editions of the BNR. If you had a chance to go to the last one, you would have seen a range of uh, UK uh, artists um, and collaborations with the British Council and the curators of the BNR. But that is just one component of our work in the arts. We work across the spectrum. Um, and when I say that, I mean uh, what is seen as more elite, high-end um, uh, 
uh, sort of institutions. So we have previously partnered with MASPI around the uh, area of architecture, and we've created also programs in exchange between other cultural institutions in other states. So we actually just don't work in Sao Paulo or Rio. We actually work across Brazil. And uh, in my uh, example, you can see that music festival. Those artists at uh, Porto Festival this week is actually um, all online, but um, those artists have come across Brazil. We had a range of applications and selected 500 female artists to participate in a program. So uh, all women, so you can see that actually we work with artists individually, um, and we work also with um, institutions at medium and sort of the, the uh, higher, more, um, those institutions have been around a long time um, because we want to create opportunity at all levels. Um, and that's really important. And digital enables us to do that. So I think that that is a really um, key platform and tool for us in the arts and culture sector moving forward. Thank you, Andrew. So, Inia Lan, uh, she's asking you to please elaborate more the concept you mentioned in your slide, embracing the world offline and online embracing creativity, about purchasing pieces of art. Sure. So, um, you know, uh, Evangeline and I talked a little bit yesterday about the idea of NFTs and this emerging trend. Um, and I think that uh, what we're seeing more and more is, is that we have a, at least uh, the people I talk to have a thirst to actually get back outside and be able to connect with others. And I prefer the Portuguese word presencial, you know, in person, uh, because that is really something important given the number of restrictions that we've had during the pandemic. And I think that uh, we want to be able to continue that. And to give you a personal story, I arrived in Brazil um, during the pandemic in September 2022, uh, 2020, excuse me. And I came from Bangladesh, a very different context, of course. And to be actually be able to work just inside and not have that opportunity to meet people in person um, was, I think, a very un-Brazilian experience, okay? because, you know, uh, Brazilians are very, as you can see from the perception survey, open and welcoming and, uh, you know, work and partnership is done and created through um, relationships that you foster in person. So it's very strange behind the screen. That said, however, in the art and culture world, what digital allows us to do is firstly, you know, you can have the offline elements. So if you think about festivals, you could have the still the, the festivals and they are coming back more and more, right, that we can attend in person. But on top of that, you can therefore have this whole experience around it uh, online, which enables more and more people to uh, really engage and have that opportunity to attend and participate. So a good example of that might be, for example, uh, Chairman José talked about Henry Moore exhibition. Now that's in Rio, but if I'm in Salvador and I'm not able to go to Rio, but I'm interested to see that, how am I able to participate? And the technology nowadays allows us more and more to be able to do that. And as a society, during the pandemic, one positive outcome is that we have taken a leap, a jump in terms of technical competency in calls. If you remember, probably before the pandemic, you know, and a few years showing my age, we had Skype. We only had Skype and Skype was a brand new thing and some people used it and some people didn't. Then we had WhatsApp. And now this is something that is really native to us all, to be able to go on a screen, have this kind of event online. But we also don't want to lose the face-to-face, -face, the relationship building, the really important part of public diplomacy, uh, which happens actually in person. So that's why I'm saying about the combination between the two, rather than being exclusive in one or the other. I have a question for uh, Ambassador Zambuja and for you, Andrew. Uh, maybe you can start as you've been talking, we'll start uh, the question to you and then Ambassador Zambuja will answer the same question. It's from Paulo Menekeni. 
you like to ask a question about the title of the event, Cultural Diplomacy as Soft Power. What is the relation that Mr. Newton sees between the two concepts? Yeah, so I, that's, um, that's a very good question. And we pr probably, I would say, um, need a, you know, a caipirinha and um, a long um, chat around um, being able to discuss this in more detail. But in, in summary to me, um, and maybe the ambassador probably can give a more articulated answer, I would say. But to me, in summary, that soft power is, is one element of, of cultural diplomacy, really, is how I would summarize it. Uh, in its form. And then cultural relations is, again, another sort of subset of the idea of soft power. Interestingly, um, soft power as a term is um, not, is, has not been adopted so widely these days. Um, in the UK, uh, when we talk in foreign policy conversations, it's more common now to say brand UK. Uh, so that's uh, just taking away, I think, some of the, the strong language that can exist in English, at least, around, um, around that term. But over to you, Ambassador. So, I think when, when Joseph Nye thought of soft power, he was trying to find an expression which would suggest ways of influencing events outside the old, tested, dangerous forms of military, economic, uh, punitive power, be whatever. And I thought that culture uh, in a soft power was a, a, a useful tool. I have no, 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 no desire to suggest that it's the only way of saying it. Simply, when you say uh, British brand, then you have each country having its own, so we would have a multiplicity. The word, the expression soft power is comfortable, it suggests the non-military or financial or coercive use of influence to generate effects which you find desirable. So I think that uh, the word diplomacy to me suggests something which is very much done uh, by diplomats or through channels. So diplomacy to me is in a sort of way a bit restrictive. Uh, I will go on living with soft power because it encompasses, I think, more ingredients than cultural diplomacy. Cultural diplomacy is very useful but does not define a number of things which uh, I think should also be encompassed. So I'm, I have no preference for a specific language. What I would like to suggest is that all of us are realizing that it is one of the most effective, least expensive, and more, more beneficial process of bringing people together is through culture, through shared experiences of a peaceful nature. Uh, you could say uh, cultural diplomacy, or you could say peaceful diplomacy, a diplomacy which is made with the tools of peace, uh, conversation, uh, influence, arts, beauty, uh, love. So basically, love diplomacy, a diplomacy which in a sense suggests that people do better when they are seduced more than when they are threatened. So uh, I find that we, we, we can go on talking about expressions. All this will come up. Uh, so the more power to your brand, to all brands which seek the same thing, which is to bring people closer together and in a sense to make us more uh, cooperative. And, uh, and I, we, we, we feel this is uh, secondary to the essence, which is uh, culture remains extremely useful. And if I may say it again and again, cheap. Uh, I know no way of acting which costs so little. Uh, uh, someone who has been involved in operations of a financial or military nature, the costs are enormous. I mean, compared with the budgets which uh, cultural organizations 
use. We are dealing with peanuts here. I don't want to uh, undervalue peanuts, which I think uh, I like peanuts, but it's out. The idea is that we, you spend a very little and you get a great mileage and great leverage and great influence. So uh, blah, blah, uh, words here can be used in different ways. Cultural diplomacy, soft power, brand, whatever country is. But I understand that the word power, even when used uh, in the sense of soft, always suggests the essence of power. Power, no matter how soft it is, is power. Uh, so I, I see your point uh, of the point of those who are reluctant to use power in any capacity. But to me, it remains a useful way of expressing what I want to say to you, Baba. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, Could I, um, sorry. Yes, so please go ahead. Just to um, come in and just um, following on from the Ambassador's comments, actually, Ambassador, yesterday you asked me about uh, Brexit. So I thought it was just interesting to just touch upon that um, topic around partnership and collaboration in soft power. And as you say, the brand tends to just um, link itself to one country, but that, you know, even within the context of Brexit, that the European nations, you mentioned the Institute of Cervantes, uh, that we still work together as part of UNIC, um, which is the European Union of Cultural Institutes, and that we're still an active, uh, uh, though associate member of UNIC, we're a partner to be able to work together and collaborate and maximize uh, cultural relations impact uh, with Brazil. So there's a lot of international collaboration that I should also say, um, it's not just bilateral that um, goes on uh, here uh, as it does across the rest of the world. So we have another question for Ambassador Zimbuja. Um from your perspective as a diplomat, is culture a center of Brazilian foreign policy? How Brazilian diplomacy can promote cultural relations? Your, your speaking. Could you say it again? How, how what can sure. promote? Uh, a bit louder. From your perspective as a diplomat, is culture at the center of Brazilian foreign foreign policy? How Brazilian diplomacy can promote cultural relations? Well, well, well I, I think by, in a sense, by generating trust, confidence, uh, goodwill. I know these are intangibles. I, I don't know how even to define the words I'm using, but trust confidence, goodwill, an atmosphere. Uh, culture deals with profound realities, but realities which are not so easy to measure or assess. So I think that uh, Brazil perc is perceiving the world positively by its music, by its arts, by its sports, by its joy, and negatively by its violation of human rights by its neglects of the environment. So we are seen because of this mixture of our virtues and our failures. And what I think cultural diplomacy, soft power can do is to enhance the positive aspects, generate more trust, more confidence. I'll use again another word which is not diplomatic, more love that generates for us goodwill a desire to come and visit. You know, tourism is inspired by curiosity, by a desire to know more about the other. Where does he live? What, what, what country is this? So we, we must, in a sense, be aware that Brazil had an enormous capital of goodwill built around the world. Until a few years ago, uh, whenever I said I was Brazilian, this generated not admiration, but generally a smile. Uh, people will heard that I was Brazilian and a smile will come because we are the sort of country which people thought of with a smile. The associations were positive. We were seen as, I'm not suggesting that we were, which we were not, uh, a, a racial democracy 
uh, a cultural paradise, a tropical uh, uh, haven. No, it was simply the idea that here was a laboratory, a laboratory where people try to live together in a somewhat creative ways and trying to find new ways of adaptation to each other. We were not exemplary, but we were interesting. We, we were one of the ways in which the world could perhaps learn to live together. We were interesting. So in right now we are slightly threatening. What I think happened in the country is that we moved from being interesting to being threatening. The idea that this is a place where damage can be done to the environment or to other human beings, which is something so contrary to our nature and to our history and to our traditions, that will be easy to correct, I hope, in a few months. Thank you, Bamba. Thank you, Ambassador. Well, uh, we have one more question that will be the, the last one to Andrew. That's from Mark Thompson. Aside from all the great work the UK and the British Council is doing here, there is a significant base of knowledge and innovative ideas among the population of UK citizens living and working in Brazil. How can we leverage human knowledge base? Yes, great, great, great question, Mark. And I think that that is something uh, really in, in my view, but um, also Ambassador, if you have, uh, have some thoughts, please do share them. Uh, and two things, one is just a more practical level that the in UK specifically has set up a network of honorary consuls across Brazil um, of those who've had great connections to the UK and be able to, who live in different states and provide that partnership on behalf of the UK um, within a particular state. So we have um, Marie Consul in Pará, we have uh, one in Paraná as well, Adam Patterson. Uh, we also have one in uh, Rio Grande do Sul, in uh, Bahia as well. So we do have a network which be able to extend and share that idea uh, of, the, of sort of the knowledge um, that you refer to. I think also, however, there's a, an opportunity to be able to engage more widely. If you mention from my, if you remember, sorry, from the, my presentation, I talked about scholarships and the importance of the scholarship network. And um, what you're trying to do there is uh, really engage a great network of, of um, leaders who, in the shipping program, who have a very uh, long and important connection with the UK, have come back to Brazil and provide a lot of thought leadership and insight across that network. But we're trying to expand that out now also uh, to have a, a larger UK alumni program, which I think really is important to therefore bring in that knowledge uh, and understanding and background and people together. So um, that's something we're trying to do again, digitally, online and offline. And I think that that will really provide a, a great way for people to come together. The challenge, of course, with any alumni network, and I'm sure all of you are a member of some alumni group, is about time and utility, the value that you get from um, offering your time within that network. So it's important that we get that exchange right, the knowledge right, to be able to um, build a, a wider, wider knowledge base and group in Brazil. Thank you, Andrew. Now we are going to end up our debate. And uh, I want to thank you both for being here and uh, enlightening our perspective of uh, good relations between that we have already between England and Brazil and uh, Sabri. We hope to continue this conversation in another time and to make some projects together. That would be really great. And um, we are going to uh, ask our president, P.U. José P.U. Borges, to end up this uh, webinar. Thank you for our public to stay with us, and thank you all. Thank you, Van Van. Thank you, Marcos. Thank you, Andrew. Marcos, I remember uh, years ago, a former member of SEBRI, Professor Elio Vagaribi, used to say that Italy conquered the world in the 15th century 
through the Renaissance by seduction. And this is exactly the, the, the meaning of uh, soft power that uh, we had in mind when we created this group led by Vavan and you. So Andrew, thank you very much. I hope that this is the first of many initiatives that we, Sabri and the British Council have together. And uh, it was a wonderful uh, uh, presentation and we thank you very much. Thank you, Marcos. Thank you, Vavan. Thank you. Thank you. If you want to say something, Andrew, just uh, say goodbye, please. Yeah, I'd just like to say thank you to um, obviously the audience who've been able to join us for the last hour or so, and also to Sebi for the in invitation. I think that this is, um, just as I said at the beginning, an opportunity and a start to be able to have more dialogue, more debate, more insight, and um, really look forward to having that opportunity to partner with you more. So thank you so much. And thank you, Ambassador, for your great insights as well.